So a formal trustee of the Vermont Historical Society and a current Superior Court judge, Robert Mello has, been a, has had a lifelong fascination with American history and the law, especially the early history of Vermont. Tonight, Mello joins us to discuss his recent biography, Moses Robinson and the Founding of Vermont, about perhaps Vermont's most important founding father that you have never heard of. And I'm going to hand this off to Robert. Thank you for inviting me to, to come tonight to the to the Phoenix Bookstore, one of my favorite shops. I've been here many times, and all the times I've been here, I've never managed to walk out without yet another book. And, and I've managed to do it again tonight. So thank you very much. And thank you, folks, for coming out tonight. I heard a story this morning that uh, this past January was 11% colder than the past 30, the average 30 year average for Januarys. And so far this February, it's been 40% colder than the last 30 years. And uh, judging from tonight, uh, it doesn't seem like it's warming up any. So you're all very brave to come out. No wonder Vermonters are such a hardy breed. So I appreciate you coming out to uh, visit with me about Moses Robinson and the founding of Vermont. The book is published by the Vermont Historical Society. <clears throat> it came out just in September, and the Historical Society, of course, is Vermont's premier organization for Vermont history. They provide education throughout the state for uh, kids as well as adults. They have, they have museums in Barrie and tremendous archive, archives of amazing historical uh, objects from our past. And uh, they don't publish very many books, very few, maybe. Uh, three or four a year, and they're all peer-reviewed, so it's a privilege that they agreed to publish the book. So I was a trial lawyer for 40 years, almost 40 years before I became a judge, and it was as a lawyer that I became interested in Moses Robinson. I learned pretty early on that he was our first Chief Justice, and so I was curious to learn as much as I could about our first Chief Justice, but as I looked for material on his life, I couldn't find much of anything. I saw that he was not only our first Chief Justice, but he was also governor, and he was also a US Senator. And yet, there were no biographies about him. There weren't even any significant articles about him. He basically was unknown. In 2005, I met with the former director of the Vermont Historical Society, Kevin Graffinino, uh, and Sam Hand. Some of you may know Sam. He was the Dean of Vermont Historians until he passed away a few years ago. And they encouraged me to write a book about Moses Robinson if I could find enough original material about him to do a biography. So I went searching. I searched at the Vermont Historical Society and all their archives. I went to the UVM Special Collections and found original letters to and from Moses Robinson. I went to the Bennington Museum and found a wealth of materials down there on the Robinsons and also on Moses. I went to the Vermont Archives uh, and found a tremendous amount of material there as well. I went to the New Hampshire State Archives to find the early deeds for Vermont because Vermont was thought to be part of New Hampshire and the earliest deeds are in Concord and yet nobody seemed to have known that. I seem to have discovered that. And I found the original Vermont Supreme Court, court records, the very first records, uh, the very first several years, in a vault at the Rutland Superior Court in Rutland. And so I kind of rediscovered them. I also went to the Hardwick, Massachusetts Historical Society, which is the town where he was born. So in going through all these materials, I was able to find um, more than enough to do a full-length biography of Moses Robinson. And it soon became clear to me that he was much, much more than just our first Chief Justice, as important as that alone might be. So let me give you some examples. <clears throat> I learned that Moses Robinson played a central role in the founding of our state. Um, for example, he was a leader of Vermont's revolt from New York in the early 1770s. So when Settlers first started coming to Vermont in the 60s, the 1760s and early 70s. Everybody thought 
Vermont was owned by New Hampshire. The governor of New Hampshire claimed New Hampshire owned Vermont and had chartered hundreds of towns in Vermont, Bennington being the very first. And so settlers were buying up land um, and moving to Vermont by the thousands uh, over those 20 years. And they were all buying land through New Hampshire charters. Unfortunately, Governor Benning Wentworth never bothered to tell these innocent purchasers that the hard-earned money they were paying and the land they were buying might not actually belong to New Hampshire because New York also claimed it. He didn't disclose that in the deeds. And sure enough, eventually New York woke up to what was going on and said, wait a minute, we own Vermont. And so there was this tug of war. The king eventually agreed with New York and said, no, New York owns Vermont. And, and suddenly the authorities in New York said, those deeds, all that land you bought, tens of thousands of acres to the Robinsons alone, we don't recognize their validity. You didn't get it from us. Your deeds are invalid. And not only that, we're going to evict you from your land. And so that triggered a revolt. And Moses Robinson was a leader of the revolt. The towns that revolted along the east side of the mountains joined forces. They all had their committees of safety and they joined forces and they started having conventions. The revolt was spearheaded by Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys. They used vigilante tactics in the revolt. For example, if they found someone who had bought their land under a New York title, um, or if they found someone who was claiming to be a New York authority uh, operating in Vermont, they would burn down their house, tie them to a tree and give them 30 lashes or more, burn their crops and threaten them with certain death if they ever returned. And over the course of four years, um, Vermont became completely ungovernable by New York. Uh, it descended into chaos, run by the Green Mountain Boys, who would put Yorkers um, on trial these kangaroo courts, the, uh, the Green Mountain Boys were judge, jury, and executioner. They would try them, find them guilty, and then um, whip them and, and order them never to come back. So Vermont became, descended into chaos, and in an effort to try to create some sort of government in Vermont, the towns on the west side of the Green Mountains joined together and had held conventions many conventions designed to try to establish some laws, declare our independence, uh, and try to create some order. Moses Robinson was a delegate, delegate at those conventions, and he was a delegate at the September 25, 1776 Dorset Convention that declared Vermont to be independent from New York. And he helped write, he with Thomas Chittenden helped write the Covenant and Compact that declared Vermont to be independent from New York. So he was a leader of the revolt. He became a leader of the effort to create a new government. When the conventions created a grand committee to try to run things, Robinson was elected to the grand committee. When um, Seth Warner replaced Ethan Allen as the head of the Green Mountain Boys, um, Moses Robinson was elected to take Seth Warner's place as colonel of the Bennington Militia. So the, the Bennington Militia uh, so elected him to be their general to take the place of the famous um, uh, and great Seth Warner. Uh, and, at, and Robinson was with his regiment at Mount Independence when uh, General John Burgoyne, British General John Burgoyne, invaded Vermont intending to crush the revolution from the north. Uh, he invaded Vermont with over 7,500 um, soldiers and mercenaries and Native Americans uh, and quickly overwhelmed the small force that was trying to defend um, Fort Ticonderoga. So uh, Robinson was there to try to help defend the fort uh, and when the general in charge of the American forces decided it was hopeless, he, Robinson was ordered to return to Bennington while Seth Warner was ordered to go to Hubbardton and fight a rearguard action so that the rest of the army could escape. <clears throat> so back in Bennington, 
uh, Moses Robinson uh, discovered that he had been elected. At the same time, all this is going on, as Burgoyne is, 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 is laying siege to Fort Ticonderoga, <clears throat> Vermont's delegates are in Windsor adopting our constitution and um, establishing our first government. Robinson wasn't there. He was with his regiment. But even though he wasn't there, he was elected to the Council of Safety, which was a 12-man committee to run Vermont's government until the Constitution could go into effect. So as a militia colonel and member of our first government, the Council of Safety, Robinson helped organize uh, the effort to defend Bennington against Burgoyne's um, army. And, um, um, and he helped organize the successful defense at the Battle of Bennington. Later, uh, when the Constitution went into effect in 1778, Moses Robinson was elected our first Chief Justice. At the time he was elected, he, by the way, had no legal training. He never went to college. He had probably some common school education, but not much. There were no um, teachers in Hardwick, Massachusetts, where he grew up, who spent much time in his part of the town. So he had very little um, education. He was mostly homeschooled. Um, but yet, he became our first Chief Justice. None of the five justices were law trained. And at the time he, was chief, he became Chief Justice, the court had no cases to hear, um, no rules to follow, no organized bar to call upon, no law books to consult, no budget, except for a clerk, he had no staff, and, uh, and except for the courthouse in Westminster where the uh, famous Westminster massacre occurred, there was no place for the court to meet. So he had to create everything literally from scratch. Um, in 1786, he was president of our first constitutional convention after the Windsor Convention of 1777. That was our first constitution. The constitution had a provision that said every seven years, we're going to elect, the people will elect this council of censors. And their job is going to be to see how the government's been doing to make sure that the government has been following the constitution and how they've been adopting any laws or policies that are unconstitutional, and are there any things that need, are there any changes that we need to make to the Constitution to improve it? So the Council of Censors uh, met, and this very formal uh, body um, was controlled by the political faction that would eventually become Vermont's Federalists. And they proposed changes to the Constitution that would have completely overturned the former democracy we've inherited from our, from our founders. The Vermont Constitution of 1777 has been described by historians, historians as the most um, democratic constitution of all the states adopted up to that time. It provided for universal suffrage, which means Women couldn't vote back then, but all men could vote who had reached the age of 21 and taken the Freeman's Oath. You didn't have to own any property. You didn't have to have any wealth. If you were 21 and took the oath and you were a Vermonter, you lived here for a year, you could vote. So it was universal suffrage. And um, everybody, every town governed itself through town meeting. And the, this Council of Censors uh, proposed that the Constitution be changed so that instead of it, instead of the General Assembly, for example, being elected by the people, it would be elected by county officials um, who were elected only by property owners. And the, and the, um, there would be property ownership requirements. So only the property people would control the government. It would have completely overturned our bottom grassroots democracy and turn it into the hands of the wealthy elite. Robinson became, was elected president of the convention and under his leadership the convention rejected those amendments um, and also um, adopted uh, amendments that um, guaranteed the independence uh, and integrity of the judiciary. Many of the 
Many of the provisions that were adopted in that Constitution of 1786 are still in our Constitution today. Robinson was obviously very proud of what he had accomplished and what his convention had accomplished because he signed the second Constitution uh, on July 4th, 1786, 10 years to the day of the Declaration of Independence. So he was um, president of the Constitutional Convention that saved our very democratic form of government. Robinson was a member of Thomas Chittenden's inner circle of closest advisors. He was a member of the Governor's Council um, during the, the first dozen years of our existence. And as a member of the council, he helped uh, Chittenden uh, deal with crisis after crisis, repeated invasions by the British into the north part of Vermont. Um, the Yorkers in, ben in Wyndham County, um, in Wyndham County, the people there, the majority of people there did not recognize this upstart government in Vermont. They um, wanted to remain part of New York and they revolted repeatedly. And so there were these revolts they had to deal with. Plus there was a tremendous amount of pressure in um, northeastern Vermont, centered um, around Windsor, where the people there wanted to create a separate state centered on the Connecticut River, consisting of towns in eastern Vermont and western New Hampshire. And so um, they threatened that if you, Vermont, go, Vermont, don't annex the western third of New Hampshire, we, dozens of towns in eastern Vermont, are going to secede to New Hampshire or create our own state. So that they had all these crises, um, plus Tories, spies, British spies, and residents in Vermont, Vermonters, um, who were British sympathizers and we're cooperating with the British. It's because of those Tories, for example, that Burgoyne learned Bennington had the, all those stores that he wanted to capture. So there are all these crises that, that Thomas Chittenden and Moses Robinson, who became the most, the, the, the most senior uh, counselor, had to deal with. So Moses Robinson, as I said, was, the, um, was a a close friend and a close um, colleague of Thomas Chittenden, but he was also a friend of Ethan and Ira Allen. And Robinson agreed with Chittenden, Ethan Allen, and Ira Allen on most issues. But Robinson was independent-minded, and he disagreed with them on some very important issues, most notably statehood for Vermont. Ethan and Ira Allen were not in favor of statehood for Vermont. They were more interested in relationships with Canada, Britain through Canada. After all, they lived up here in northern Vermont. Robinson was down in southern Vermont. Robinson wanted us to be part of the state, part of, part of the Union, rather, joining Congress. The Allens wanted us to have the relationship with Canada instead. And Chittenden sided with, um, with the Allens on that issue. So Moses Robinson broke with Thomas Chittenden on the issue of statehood. And it was because of that break that Moses Robinson was elected governor in October 1789. So in addition to everything else, he was also our second governor. And while he was governor, he oversaw the settlement of the 20 year long, then by then 20 year long dispute with New York over our independence and over land titles in Vermont. He, in his one year as governor, oversaw the settlement, the negotiations that led to the settlement of that dispute. And um, the following year, um, he was elected vice president of the Constitutional Convention that was called to ratify um, the Constitution. Once New York agreed we can become a state, then Congress said, all right, you can become a state, but you need to ratify the Constitution. So there was a constitutional convention in Bennington, and Robinson was elected the vice president of that convention. It was not a foregone conclusion that um, the convention would vote to ratify the Constitution. The ultimate vote was very lopsided. I think only four delegates voted against it. But the debates were intense, and they're absolutely fascinating. 
Um, it was anti classic anti-federalist, federalist arguments made, plus tremendous distrust that if we joined the, the Union and became subject to federal courts, the fear was federal courts would side with New York on the land titles dispute and, th and throw the Vermonters off their land. That was the biggest reason I believe Chittenden was on the fence and, and essentially against statehood for Vermont. But part of the settlements Robinson achieved with New York dealt with that issue. But there was still lingering distrust as, a, as to whether the settlement would work. And, but eventually the, the convention ratified the Constitution and we became a state. We became a state just five months after Robinson took office. And it's because of what he did, uh, his leadership as governor, that uh, we became a state. He, he played a, an important role uh, in that in the fact that we are a state. So Moses Robinson played a central role in the founding of Vermont, yet nobody's ever heard of him. Most Vermonters have never heard of him. And so how can that be? Most Vermonters, if, they, if you ask them about Vermont's founding, oh, well, Ethan Allen, that's, why, that's who founded Vermont. And they, might, they might remember Ira Allen and Thomas Chittenden, but some, those three people did not create Vermont. Vermont was created by a, a group of people, um, and the most important of those group of people who have never been heard of before is Moses Robinson. So my book tries to set the record straight and um, give him his rightful place uh, as one of our most important founders. My book also explains in one place, and in language written for the average reader, um, how Vermont came to be. because. I've came to the conclusion that Moses Robinson played a central role in the founding of Vermont. I could not tell the story of his life without also retelling the story of Vermont's founding. So the book is really two books in one. It's a biography of Moses Robinson, but it also is an explanation of how our state came to be um, during the early years. After um, the Constitutional Convention, Robinson was elected our first US Senator. And he served in the Senate for five years. He then re resigned so that he could run for governor again. He was unsuccessful. Uh, Isaac Tickner beat him. Uh, but he was, he was a US Senator for five years. So here's Vermont in New England. New England is solidly Federalist. And Moses Robinson and the Vermont's other Senator, uh, Stephen Rowe Bradley, Repub Jeffersonian Republicans. The only two. They sided with Jefferson um, because Jefferson's um, philosophy of uh, states' rights, that our best bulwark of liberty is citizens governing themselves at the local level. A federal government with huge massive powers is itself a, a risk of, of losing our independence. And so uh, they. The, the theories of Jefferson resonated with Robinson and uh, Bradley and the two of them, despite New England being a solidly Federalist, generally voted um, in favor of Jefferson's uh, policies in the Senate. So, um, so those are the roles that Robinson played uh, in our founding. Uh, not only was he an important member of the founding generation, but he was also a very admirable fellow. He was a family man. He was a deacon of his church. He strongly believed in public service. Um, he rubbed shoulders with the most important people of his day, um, George Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Adams, the, the Allens and Chittenden. But he never forgot the yeoman farmer, the small business person, the, the original settlers, the folks who fought the revolution, he never forgot them. He fought for their rights throughout his life, both uh, in, in the government here in Vermont and in the U.S. Senate. So I believe that he is not only a fascinating character because of what he did, but I think our youth, who young, young Vermonters who are, might be considering 
careers in public service would find him um, an inspiration. Uh, be, and I think we also can learn a great deal from Moses Robinson um, because uh, Moses Robinson lived through and helped our state, our fledgling state, survive economic downturns, protracted wars, political polarization, negative campaign tactics, and gridlock in government. In the Senate, when Robinson was in the Senate, the Senate was so closely divided between Federalists and Jeffersonian Republicans that repeatedly Adams had to break ties. And it never happened before in the first two years, but it was a very polarized time. And so many of the problems we are dealing with today, his generation of leaders also had to deal with. So he, in my view, his most important achieve achievements are that he was instrumental in creating our judicial system. He helped lead the drive for Vermont to become the 14th state. And as president of that 1786 Constitutional Convention, he helped preserve Vermont's uniquely democratic uh, form of government, participatory government. So let me just tell you about two moments in his life where I wish I could have been a fly on the wall. There were two of them. One was um, in the summer of 91, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison visited Bennington. They were up, they decided to make a tour of the northern states. Uh, and so they went up as far as uh, Albany and then up to Lake Champlain. They went sailing in the lake. They did a lot of tourism uh, and uh, enjoyed themselves picking blueberries. Uh, but they also had a very serious purpose. The nation was beginning to divide into Hamiltonian uh, Federalists versus Jeffersonian Republicans. That was beginning. And he, Jefferson and Madison wanted to see um, whether there was any support in the North for their views. And so they would talk to the average people, local people, to see what they thought about some of their ideas. And they stopped in Bennington. And Moses Robinson learned that they were there. And so he invited them to spend the day with him. So they went to the church with him and they visited the battlefield of Battle in Bennington. And they went to his farm and they had dinner at his home. And they talked about politics and a number of other things. And when the talk turned into politics, they discovered that the two of them saw eye to eye in terms of their political philosophy. And when Jefferson got back home, in his ledger he wrote that um, from his perspective, the high point of hope that there would be any support in the North for his policies was his stop in Bennington. Uh, and so, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall when Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and some other local Bennington leaders were having dinner with Moses Robinson at his house. The other time I wish I could have been a fly on the wall uh, is more related to the fact that I was a lawyer and I'm now a judge. So in um, May of 1779, so this is just five or six months after Moses Robinson has elected Chief Justice, he has his first major case. There's been the first uh, major outbreak um, revolt of the Yorkers in what is now Wyndham County. Um, the, the new Vermont government, the governor and council, Chittenden, Robinson and the rest, had voted to raise a militia, raise another 100 men or 150 men uh, of militiamen to help defend the northern frontier. The governor general of Canada, every spring would send down raiding parties and they would destroy enough food to feed thousands of people for months. And so they were trying to raise, the Vermont government, new government was trying to raise men to fight uh, and defend the frontier. Uh, and so um, you either joined up or you had to pay a fee for if you refused to, to serve. And in, in Wyndham County, um, the people who did not recognize this new fledgling government, this offspring of anarchy, as they called it, um, refused to either enlist or pay the fee. So the local sheriff 
took two of their cows and marched off with their cows to sell them at an auction to raise the money for the fees. A hundred armed uh, Yorkers in the county seized the sheriff, rescued the cows, returned the cows to the owners. So it seems like a small dispute involving two cows, but what was at risk, of course, was, what was at stake, of course, was who are we or are we not going to be able to govern southeastern Vermont? Are we going to allow the rebels, the counter-revolutionaries, it was really a counter-revolt, to get their way? Are we going to assert our authority? So the government um, asked Ethan Allen to raise up another 100 men, Green Mountain Boys. They went down, they arrested the leaders, and Moses Robinson and the five Supreme Court justice, justices uh, went to Westminster um, to try uh, these rebels. So there were no lawyers to speak of in Vermont at the time. Uh, there were two that had been recently admitted. One was Stephen Burrow Bradley. Uh, he was appointed to be uh, the defense attorney. The court appointed him to defend uh, the Yorkers. And uh, the other was the other lawyer in the area was uh, elected to be the prosecutor. And so Bradley and the prosecutor, Smith, uh, consulted their law book, which was probably the only book they had, but they consulted the laws, and they then went to the court with motions. One of the motions was, you need to, you need to dismiss these three charges, judge, because uh, these three men were under the age of 21. They were minors, and therefore they can't be charged uh, as adults. And so Robinson said, that's the law. They're dismissed. And uh, the prosecutor agreed that three others, there wasn't enough evidence uh, to support the charge. Robinson said, if there isn't enough evidence, case dismissed. Well, Ethan Allen then heard that people were being dismissed and let go from by the court, something the Green Mountain Boys never did in their uh, impromptu kangaroo trials. So Ethan Allen, in full regalia as a general, full military regalia, with his sword, marches into the court and starts lambasting the lawyers for their excessive reliance on law books. <laughs> he said, my reasoning from the, from the fitness, the eternal fitness of things is better logic than your Gladstones, and he made a joke of it. Um, so uh, then Robinson, when he realized, when, when he got over the shock of, the, of this appearance, he said, General, um, you cannot wear a sword in this court. You know, you need to respect the court, and you know, if you want to speak, you need to ask for permission. So Ethan Allen throws down his hat, takes off his sword, and continues to berate the lawyers. And then he turns to Robinson and said, don't you dare let these people out slip through your fingers, and then marches out. They hadn't been convicted of anything yet. So I wish I had been a fly on the wall that day when Robinson um, confronted Ethan Allen. Um, and Robinson said, no, we're not going to follow the ways of the Green Mountain Boys. We're not going to have a kangaroo court. We're not going to have a, um, um, a lawless trial. I'm going to follow the law. And he continued to rule on motions. And the next motion was a motion by Bradley that said, there are two counts here. One is a count of common law um, treason, and the other was a count of, of treason by statute. And he said, you can't, you can't convict these people under the statute, because although the statute had been enacted, it hadn't been published. The public people had no way to know it was the law. Robinson said, that's right. That's, that's, uh, we're we're going to throw that count out. If you're going to get a conviction, it has to be on the common law. So he followed the rule of law. He, he left behind, even though he had been a leader of the revolt, the ways of the, of the Green Mountain Boys uh, and followed the law, and we've been following the law ever since. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or go upstairs to sign any books, but thank you very much for coming. Uh, you had said originally that Moses Robinson was friends with Ethan Allen. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that changed. Am I uh, right, or were they just? 
they agree to disagree? I think they agree to disagree. Robinson had an amazing ability to work with people even though he disagreed with them. Uh, he, um, he disagreed with Ira Allen over the Eastern, the Second Eastern Union. That was a period of time when we annexed, the second time we annexed the Western Third of New Hampshire, which almost resulted in civil war in North, Northern New England. Uh, uh, and so um, Robinson opposed that, even though he was a close, had always been a close ally with Ira Allen. Uh, and he had that confrontation with Ethan Allen uh, at that courthouse. But later, when Ethan Allen married Fanny, um, he, Ethan had asked Moses to officiate, preside over the marriage. And so he did. Um, Moses Robinson supported the French Revolution. He, well, he supported Thomas Jefferson, and he was a friend of Ethan Allen, even though both of them were deists. Ethan a Moses Robinson was a deacon of his church profoundly a religious man. Uh, but, he didn't, but, he, but even though Jefferson and Allen were deists, which in those days was the, considered the equivalent of being an atheist, he supported them, uh, Jefferson and his policies, and was a friend of Ethan Allen. And he supported the French Revolution, even though the French Revolution was led by avowed atheists. So he could disagree with people, even profoundly, but still work with them. He, d he completely disagreed with Nathaniel Chipman and Isaac um, Tickner um, on, um, on a, a bill called the Betterman Act. So this was an act that was designed to help frontiers, frontier settlers who had purchased land based on very poor and inaccurate surveys and then had built their farms on the land only to find out that they didn't own it, somebody else did. And so um, Moses Robinson, Thomas Chittenden, uh, and others strongly supported something called the Betterman Act, which basically said, if you um, go on, if you settle on land in the good faith belief that you own it, uh, and you put betterments on it, you make improvements, and it turns out you don't own it, under the common law, you are out of luck. But under this Betterman Act, you, you could get the value of your improvements. Plus, if you would improve the value of the land, you get a part of that too. Bitter debates in the legislature over that bill. And Robinson went to the mat with Chipman and Tickner on that. And yet, he could work with them later on statehood. So he was able to disagree with people fundamentally uh, and strongly, and yet still be able to work with them on other issues. Well, on that last point, I thought adverse possession was an old common law doctrine. Why didn't adverse possession come well, these folks? Well, maybe they didn't, this would be before the 15 years were up. This is before the 15 years were up. Yeah. Another question. I'm about a third of the way through your book. Oh, good. Yeah. And um, during the mid-revolutionary war, uh, there were at least two or three occasions when Congress was supposed to decide the land dispute between New York and New Hampshire and the Vermont uh, occupiers, let's say. But they never quite got around to it. Right. And um, uh, I don't think that you explain it, uh, why. Was that because they were distracted by the war? Was that because it was too divisive? Or was there some other reason? No. Um, this is a very interesting subject all in itself. Uh, but in a nutshell, uh, the revolution, the War of Independence left Vermont independent, both of Great Britain and the United States. We ended up being, people debate whether we were a republic or not, but whatever we were, we were independent of both. Congress considered Vermont to be a danger to the, to the republic uh, because of the dispute with New York. And not only with New York, New Hampshire claimed to own part of Vermont, New York did, and even Massachusetts did for a while. And so we were a real thorn in Congress's side. Plus we were negotiating with the British to try to keep them from, um, from any more raids like burning Royalton, for example. And they didn't like that either. So um, New York kept repeatedly pestering Congress, will you please act on our claim to own Vermont? 
And so New York was one of the largest states in the Union. Uh, so they carried a lot of clout. And so Congress did several times say, okay, we're going to decide it. We're going to have a trial. And we're going to have all the parties come, including Vermont, and they can tell us what they want to do. And then we will decide this issue for once and for all. Now, this is not the Congress we have now. This is the Continental Congress under the old Articles of Confederation. Um, unfortunately, under the Articles of Confederation, Congress could not do anything unless they had a nine vote. Nine states voted for it. And every time the question of statehood for Vermont came up, New York and New Hampshire and the four southern states would always block it. The so close, closest we ever came until Moses Robinson helped settle our dispute with New York was seven states. New York didn't want to see us become a state because they thought they owned us. New Hampshire didn't want us to become a state because they felt the same way. And the southern states didn't want to see another northern state in Congress um, because that would tip the balance of power in Congress. Which is a good segue into my next question, which is, do you think the relationship that Robinson made with Madison and Jefferson when they visited um, helped us become a state because the Southerners thought maybe we would be with them? We already were a state. Oh, at that point? We already were a state. Okay. Yeah, we became a state just five months after Robinson stepped down. Um, so Robinson presided over the settlement with New York. Chittenden is re-elected governor. But the legislature then approves Robinson's settlement, approves the tax to pay the $30,000 to New York, and, and votes to apply for statehood. And um, uh, Congress accepts the, accepts the application. Washington signs a document saying on March 4th, I think it was, Vermont will be a state. And um, that was all done very shortly after Robinson stepped down. But wasn't it critical that Kentucky then became the 14th state so that the balance of power was maintained between the North and the South? Well, the reason North why, slave and slave. the reason why, why did New York finally relent? Why did New York finally decide, okay, we're going to go along with letting Vermont become a state. Alexander Hamilton was, in, was in, instrumental in this happening. He um, urged the New York legislature to recognize Vermont. He said, look, Vermont is in fact independent. We can't, we've long since lost the ability to control them. They don't want to be a part of us. We can't force them to be. And uh, we're running the risk that they're going to run and, and rejoin the British in Canada. We should s stop our objection and agree to let them become a state. Also, because if we don't, Kentucky is about to become a state, and then the power will, in Congress will change in favor of the southern states. And that was the argument that finally um, convinced New York to um, relent and agree to let, become, let Vermont become a state. Did it help that we chipped in 30,000 bucks? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Why do you think the story of Moses Robinson was kept under wraps? <clears throat> I don't think it was kept under wraps. Um, Kevin Graffinino um, once said that the, the, the Allens hijacked Vermont history at an early day. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely true. Um, Ethan Allen uh, became such a legend, uh, and, and this happened in the 1800s. Uh, he became such a legend, um, and and it's part because of it's partly because he intended it to be that way. He was a great self-promoter, and so was Ira Allen. They wrote they wrote beautifully, they wrote persuasively, they wrote powerfully, and so um, uh, and they were centrally important. Ethan Allen was centrally important to our succeeding in, in getting independent from New York. Um, so uh, it's because of his role in the, as head of the Green Mountain Boys and the romantic image of him that generated in the 1800s that seemed to suck all the air out of the room as far as who founded Vermont. 
Um, but Vermont was founded by some really independent folks, some tough-minded folks who came up here from New York and from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and other states uh, with very little. They bought their land, not great farming, but they farmed their land. They worked hard and they were very independent. Uh, and they were not about to be dictated to by any one person. So Vermont was founded by a whole lot of people, uh, and um, almost all of whom we never heard of before. But I think the most important of that group is Robinson. Well, thank you all very much.